evening to you all. I'm Martin Logan and welcome to the Irish in the UK and a big well done to Henry McGlade for his show. Here's what's coming up tonight. We'll be chatting to Dr. Sabia Bact about pre-diabetes. We'll be visiting the Liverpool University rugby team to see how the underage are developing. But first up, Paul McGrath was here in Manchester at the Premier Lounge and Suite for a question and answer evening and what a great night it was for all Paul's fans. very excited with tonight because we've got the legend, the Republic of Ireland legend, the Manchester United legend. He played for a few other clubs as well. But we've got Paul McGrath joining us and it's going to be an amazing evening because Paul, you know, doesn't do the circuit an awful lot. So it's great to have him in Manchester where he's loved, where he's adored. Uh, everybody knows what a great player he was for Man United. And to be fair, when he, when he left and went to Aston Villa, many people probably thought it might have been the end of his career, but he had another seven amazing years there as well. So, you know, who are Paul McGrath? He's He's in, on home territory, he's here in Northern Shores at the Premier Suite and Lounge and we're looking forward to an amazing night, Martin. Just goes to show how popular he really is because the people are queuing up so much before this place is open tonight. Well, I think that's the aura of Paul McGrath because he's got that sort of character about him, isn't he? You know, he's a, a great, great person, everybody knows how well he did for Manchester United but in particular for the Republic of Ireland when we think back to the glorious 94 World Cup he was absolutely incredible you know and of course you know he was an amazing player you know we all know about the trouble he had with his knees but it never affected his performances both for United, Aston Villa, but in particular for the Republic of Ireland, and he's worshipped all over Ireland. And I'm not surprised that it's a packed house tonight. You know, yes, they were queuing up early, and it's going to be a great evening. Of course, you see all the players at Old Trafford, been the voice of Old Trafford, of course. But you know, if Jose had a player like Paul McGrath today, what would he be worth? Well, I tell you what, we could do with a Paul McGrath at the moment. I mean, if he was free and he was available and he was young enough, he would slide into the team because I tell you what, him and Eric Bailly, what a partnership that would be. I'd love to see the two of them together. It'd be absolutely incredible. It'd be back to the days of like Pallister and Bruce and Vidic and, 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 and uh, Rio. So you'd have a perfect combination there. But hey-ho, you know, not to be, but yeah, he would walk into Manchester United's team now, I can tell you that. Paul, great to see you back in Manchester. Well, it's nice to be back, you know, I, it's a place I loved. I spent most of uh, my career over here. Even when I was playing for Villa, I was living down in Manchester. I had a house down here, so, for, so it's been about 24 years I've been here. So I love the place, love the place. So um, I always, any chance I get to come back to Manchester, I'm always here. Well, of course, you've got a big fan base here and you say you love the place. But, you know, there's so many people remember you when you played for United. There's so many people love you for the way you played for the Republic of Ireland. You've got lots of people here in Manchester rooting for you. Ah, yeah, and, and, and you know, I've been blessed that uh, I, I played so many games for Ireland and for Manchester United, you know. We used to have a, a large Irish uh, um, sort of connection down here with the, the players who did play for Manchester United, but that seems to have diminished a little bit. But um, hopefully there'll be one or two Irish players now come along and, and, and Manu will snap them up again. And that'd be nice, that'd be nice. What's happened to our Irish players? Because down the years Manchester United was always renowned for having great Irish players, one after the other, including yourself, of course, Kevin Morden in that time and that year, many, many more. What's happened? Uh, to be honest, Martin, I, I honestly believe that um, teams are looking globally now, so it makes it much harder for a small nation like us to keep sending players over and um, you know tr trying to break into the first team is a difficult thing to do because um, you know as you say they're they're looking around Africa now they're looking at Australia they're looking at Asia and they're they're bringing the best of the best over to to uh, to England at the moment because it's the best league in the world so it's 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 made it a little more difficult for Irish players uh, to come over. Now of course. Listen, we're here tonight, it's a special evening with Paul McGrath here at the Premier Suite in Auden Shaw. There's going to be a big crowd. Are you looking forward to it? Oh, I always do. I always, I mean, I love, you know, when Irish people are involved or, or when Manchester United people are involved, I always love coming down and chatting to them and talking about the, the things they want to talk about. If it be it, are we, are we not as good as we should be? Are we, are we better than we should be? 
I love I love chatting back to them and and I try and be as honest as I can. Some people don't like what I say, but <laughs> but um, you know, I, I I see one or two things that are going wrong in certain areas, and and I don't like it. And I tend to speak my mind and stuff like that, which might get me into a little bit of trouble. But I, but I, but I do love Manchester United. And I, the people, especially, they've never been they've never been more good to me than they have down here. So um, I, I'm blessed that that I played for this club for um, you know six and a half years. John, can you tell me a little bit about the Premier Suite and Lounge? Uh, yeah, Martin. yeah, Premier Street and Lounge, basically we do the sportsmen's dinners, um, all sorts of functions, uh, we do the weddings, the birthday parties, it's a small family business run by myself, my wife and my daughters, uh, my sister's a cook, she does all this fantastic food, so basically we do an array from three course meals to um, buffets to anything that the client wants, uh, Martin, yeah. And of course you're in for a big night, a lot of people here tonight, uh, but uh, tell me, how can people book you and where are you? Well, Martin, what we're doing, we've been doing this a, a many years now and we do the sportsmen, sportsmen's dinners, we work for the junior football clubs in the area um, and basically we have events on all the time, obviously it's mainly football, so basically if you go on the websites, uh, look on the website and then we have all the football on there and we do a lot of cabaret so we have all the top um, original artists and the, all the top end tributes as well Martin. Yeah. Everyone enjoyed meeting Paul and what a great night it was and he gave so much time to all his fans for photographs and a good old chat. Well done. Now, a lot of us are being affected by diabetes. Well, tonight we are going to be chatting to Dr. Sabia Bact about pre-diabetes. Doctor, can you tell us what is pre-diabetes? So pre-diabetes is the bit before diabetes, as the name sort of says. So it's the silent bit that if you do all the right things, you may never become diabetic. So how do we know we're in danger of getting diabetes? The difficult part about this um, part of the illness is that it's before so often most people will have no symptoms whatsoever so most people what they should be doing is going in for a yearly health check with the doctor and we recommend this for anyone over the age of 40 if anything abnormal is picked up then your doctor will routinely keep following you up how important is diet diet is extremely important it probably is one of the most key things you can do to prevent your progression to pre-diabetes or diabetes okay um, so what you need to do is concentrate on a low fat low sugar diet um, and this will prevent the progression to diabetes how important is exercise uh, for pre-diabetes is extremely important to exercise like you've mentioned it's important for everyone but more so when you're pre-diabetic things that you should be doing is you should be aiming to do at least 30 minutes of activity five days a week to try and get your resting heart rate up to try and get your sweating and that will benefit you in the long run appreciate that's very very hard to do um, if you've come from doing minimal activity so you could probably start off by doing two or three times a week and slowly building yourself up to five days a week now what effect does smoking have on diabetes so smoking, as with most other illnesses, um, can exacerbate and can quicken your path to progression to diabetes. So the key thing that if you're a smoker that you can do, if there's one thing that you choose to do, would be to stop smoking. What affects our sugar levels? So the types of food that you eat um, can affect the sugar levels. Um, also the amount of fat that you eat can also affect the sugar levels as well. People sometimes only just concentrate on the sugar, but it's the proportion of all the nutrients in the food that can contribute to it. Also the amount of activity that you tend to do can also uh, affect how much sugar is left floating in the blood. So if you are doing things like exercise, regular exercise and things like that can help reduce your blood sugar level in the long run. Does diabetes run in families? So um, some elements of diabetes can run in the family, but these days the majority of cases are probably due to lifestyle. Um, things that can affect it are a sedentary lifestyle, which a lot of us are leading these days, so obesity being the biggest killer not just for cancer but for diabetes too as well um, so obviously looking at, at what you can do uh, to reduce the risk would be great now we all wake up sometimes with aches and pains and feeling unwell and tired so when is it a good time to go and see our doctor to see if we may have pre-diabetes 
Okay, so as I mentioned earlier on, anyone above the age of 40 is applicable for a health screen and generally you are able to get blood done on a yearly basis. Once you enter that cycle, your GP will automatically um, send you on a recall if you forget as well. Now, when I was growing up, it was very unusual to hear people having diabetes. Why do you think it has become so popular? So lifestyle has changed in the past 20, 30 years. So in, the in, in terms of the types of job that people do, the hobbies that people have, the types of lifestyle people lead are completely different to what was 20, 30 years ago. So there's a big change from sort of manual labour jobs that kept people nice and fit to sort of more sedentary sort of office jobs and classroom jobs and, and things that don't require an awful lot of movement. Other things is the type of diet. Our diet is also involved, so we're now so busy that very few people actually cook meals from scratch and rely on uh, pre-made meals from supermarkets in terms of cans or packages, um, things that you find in the fridge aisle, um, just for convenience and also a rise in sort of eating out. So fast foods, restaurant foods are all got very high calorie intakes as well as high amounts of fats and sugar. So all those together alongside not doing as much exercise or not being encouraged to do as much exercise as we may have done 20, 30 years ago together have contributed to a massive rise in diabetes. Now if you've got any symptoms related to diabetes please contact your GP. Now it's time for us to take a break. Welcome back. Now, over the last few weeks, we've been featuring Gaelic football, hurling, soccer. Well, tonight, we're off to Liverpool University to find out a bit more about their underage rugby team and to see how rugby is being developed in Liverpool. Liverpool Collegiate RUFC were formed in 1925 and it was formed by the old boys of the old Liverpool Collegiate, sadly now closed down. Um, it's gone on from there, we've had uh, a bit of a wandering club as it were, but we have two sections. We have the seniors, the big boys that play down at the cricket club, and then we have a massive junior section. We've got about 300 odd players going from six all the way up to 16 and then junior Colts. My goodness, you run a very busy club here. Uh, we do. It's hard work for a lot of people. We do our little team, but there's a, a big team behind it, safeguarding. We've got a chairman and other people look after catering, look after all the kids in the RFU. So, yeah, it's a big organisation, but we're a happy ship, we think. Yeah, and you seem to have a great family involvement. We do. We, we do involve the parents because the poor parents are the ones that have to stand on the sideline in the freezing cold, in the wet, and drive the kids all around the northwest of England. And we try to do that. It is a collegiate feel. We want people to enjoy it. We want everybody to enjoy it. Yeah, and of course it's a great activity for children as well and boys growing up to get involved in a, in a good sport like rugby. Uh, it is, and it, it is for boys and girls as well. We, we stop having girls at age under 11, but we've had plenty of girls playing for us. Good team. It's a wonderful sport. If you can run around, you can chase a ball and you're happy to do it and you don't mind a bit of mud, this is the game for you. Absolutely. Now, Jill, tell me a little bit about your involvement. Well, yeah, I look after the boys, really, and make sure they're all turned out in the nice kit from Eurogold, um, our sponsor. Um, yeah, we, we sort of um, do all the catering as well. I get the team of mums or dads to help serving food to all the boys after the games, which they love. Um, and generally, I look after them in case there's any injuries. I take spare gum shields along, and I keep score of every game we play. And the Christmas um, party. And Don't I do a Christmas, Christmas party, party for them every year, uh, which they really enjoy. And when we start going on tours, I'll probably be organising that as well. So it's a, a lot of organisation, but I love it because they're really, really nice boys. And we've looked after some of them for six or seven years now and seen them grow into like well-rounded young adults now. It's really... Yeah, and that's the way it is as well. It's uh, great to see the children come here to you at a young age and, and you grow up with them, don't you, kind of thing. Yeah, you do. And you sort of almost feel like they're my own boys. I feel like I've got 28 boys now. <laughs> Um, but they are they are a nice bunch and, and that's what I really love about what sport has done for them. It sort of makes them have a, a real collegiate feel and they, they really get on well together and they have fun. I mean, it's, it is about winning sometimes, but at the same time it's about having fun and they, they really do have fun. And the lights, they flickered from the shore The boat was rocking to and fro Heading for the ducks, liver, poo How we sang 
Emma, tell me about your boys that play rugby. Yeah, my oldest boy Sean, he's, he's been playing for Liverpool Collegiate now, um, for this is his third season, he's doing really well and my younger son Thomas, he plays for the under nines, he's only just started playing this season, um, but they really enjoy it and Sean plays in school, oh and Thomas plays in school as well. Of course it's a very competitive match and uh, we watched it there and I tell you they're so determined. Yeah they are Martin, really determined. Um, they've had a really good season this season. They've been playing in the league and the Lancashire Cup as well. Um, and they're doing really well. This is the last game though of the season. Unfortunately, they got beat, but they gave a good fight and they played very well. Now, I notice it's well supported with families here this morning. It's great to see so many people out here yeah. supporting their children. Oh, yeah, Martin, they have a really good turnout. All the families come out to watch. Um, I try and get out as much as I can. Rob's mostly the one who comes. Um, but Nula likes to come and have a little cheer, don't you, Nula? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And of course, your company, Eurogold, you also sponsor the, the college teams here as well. Um, yeah, we sponsor Liverpool Collegiates, um, the club, um, just to help them out with equipment and stuff as well. Um, and then we sponsor Sean's team and there's a couple of other teams as well in the club that we sponsor. Yeah. So it's really good that we can help them out as much as we can. And of course that's really important to the development of the club as well and to the teams for the kids and everything else. Yeah, definitely. The, they, the Liverpool Collegiate, um, the, like the junior teams, have moved from um, another club um, base to here and they didn't really have much equipment here. Um, so they, they were in need of like pads for the um, for the goalposts and they needed a container to put all their equipment in. So as much as we can do and any, any, any way that we can help them, we will. Yeah, that's really good. What's it like being a mum watching your son there playing rugby? Um, at first it was a bit nerve-wracking because the, some of the tackles that they have and they get injured quite a lot. Um, but now I'm OK, I'm used to it now, so it's fine. Would you prefer to be at home than watching it here and letting them come back and tell you the one? On days like this now I like to come but when it's raining, yeah. <laughs>
Well, no, I used to go to the same school as Harry, yeah, but... Yeah, so you all met through rugby? Yeah. yeah. You got a little bit of a knock as well today, didn't you? You're going to lose one of your teeth there, I think. And it's, you've got knocked and it's cracked and, yeah, everything happens in rugby. It does, yeah. yeah. But uh, it was ready for coming out, I think, anyway. You're due a new tooth, aren't you? Yeah, I'm, I'm due a new tooth. Hopefully it'll come soon. Derek, can you tell me, uh, how did you get first uh, get involved? Uh, well, I played uh, rugby myself when I was younger, and then um, when I had Sam, who's my older son, um, he wanted to get involved when he was uh, about eight years of age. So he started in the under nines, I, I started to help coach, and then um, I coached Sam's team right through to, to, to 18 years of age. And then my younger son, Harry, I've started to help their team now, so I've kind of done a full circle and come back. So back with the under 12s now coaching. So do you enjoy coaching? I absolutely love it, yeah, every minute of it. It's just great mixing with the kids, they're just so enthusiastic. And I suppose it's great to see the team coming together as well. I know it's not all about winning, take, taking part and having fun, but it's good to see them win something as well. It is great, they're a really good bunch of lads and they do very well in tournaments. And we're going through a funny stage at the moment because we've got a lot of new lads, so it's so important for us to, um, to introduce them to the game because we're obviously going to need them a lot in the future. And Sam, you've got involved in coaching as well, I believe. Yeah, only recently, over, over the past um, year or two, I've helped coach my little brother's team and I've, I've loved every second of it, yeah. It, it, it's been, it's, I've been trying to inspire my brother to play better since I, I'm a nine at, at my age, so he wants to be a nine at his age. Right, OK, so do you uh, play rugby as well yourself? I play rugby, I play rugby at the club here and um, at university, at Ed Shield University. And, and I love, I've loved playing rugby since the age of eight. So you're going to follow in your dad's footsteps and uh, go into coaching quite a lot, are you? Most definitely. I'd love to coach when, when I'm old, or coach maybe even professional teams when I'm older. And I'm just looking to go through my badges now with um, with collegiate themselves. Oh, we wish you the very best of luck with that. Now, uh, to get uh, people involved and get children involved, how do, how do you manage to get more teams involved and more people involved? Uh, well, we're very lucky. Um, with our age group being under 12s, that's when a lot of the boys are just starting senior school. So um, a lot of the boys who already play for the team have gone on to different schools and met new friends and then they bring them to the club. So this is a really good age group and year for us at the moment. There's a lot, a big influx of new players and it's just a case of um, keeping them inspired and hope they stay with us right through to their 18. All them young lads gave it a hundred percent and it was great to see so many of the parents out supporting them. Now Henry McGlade is back next Thursday evening at seven o'clock with the Irish at home and abroad and I'm here at half past seven with the Irish in the UK. Both shows are repeated on a Saturday evening between 8 and 9 p.m. Until next time, take care.